If you are anything like me, you love a terrifying True Doc series about the most horrifying people on the planet. And rest assured, I have hunted down some of the most terrifying monsters out there. While these people haven't had a Netflix special just yet, I wouldn't be surprised to see their names pop up on my TV. All I'm saying is thank your lucky stars that these evil people were caught, cause here are the top 10 terrifying inmates who should be feared by everyone. Starting us off at number 10, Ronnie McDonald. Peters. Sentenced to prison in 1984 after randomly and violently and shooting a woman at a drive through Ronnie McPeters is definitely someone to be afraid of. After his arrest for the death of the 27-year-old woman, he was sentenced to jail, but in the first nine months of his incarceration, McPeters set multiple fires, his staff and other inmates, and in a meeting with his psychiatrist, told her that he was just filming a commercial. Due to his scary and unpredictable behavior, he was sent to San Quentin prison, where he was eventually put on death row. As time went on, his terrifying behaviors only escalated. He would smear the walls and himself with his own feces, and have conversations with his wife and children, who not only were not there, but in fact, do not exist at all. Now, of course, this this man is not mentally stable, but psychiatrists have never been able to properly diagnose him. His unpredictable behaviors paired with his extreme mental health issues have resulted in a huge debate of whether he needs to be taken off death row and instead adjust his sentence to life. The decision has not yet been made, but either way, this man will remain behind bars for the rest of his life. Coming in next at number 9, Doctor of Death. Between the years of 1999 and 2000, Maxim Petrov was an actual physician responsible for the death of 11 people. Initially, he started out with home invasions. He would go to patients' houses on strange, unannounced home visits, measure their blood pressure, and suggest they needed an injection. Petrov would quickly administer just enough medication to make them pass out, but not enough to kill them and promptly rob their homes. But it took a turn on his 13th robbery when the doctor of the anesthetized patient returned home mid robbery, and Petrov immediately stabbed the crime witnessing daughter, then strangled the knocked out patient. From there on out, it seemed like he decided to change his motives and would use a lethal mix of a variety of different drugs to take the victims' lives rather than just put them to sleep. Purposefully using a different variety of drugs in an attempt to throw off police from him having any medical knowledge, he would rob the houses, then set them on fire to destroy the evidence. But authorities eventually found a link between all the victims. They were all lung patients on the same list. And later, when Petrov went to visit another of the patients on that list, officers arrested him and he admitted to his wrongdoings. Initially suspected for committing 19 killings, he was only confirmed with 11, but still sentenced to life in prison, where he remains to this day. Next up at number 8, Son of Sam. Maybe one of the most infamous killers of all time, the Son of Sam, or legally David Berkowitz, is responsible for the death of at least 6 people in New York City during the 1970s. Berkowitz liked to taunt the police and would send in mocking letters with promise of future crimes. He was highly publicized by the press, and by 1977, Seven, he was finally arrested on account of eight shootings. Now, initially he confessed to all of the killings, stating he was obeying orders of a demon that manifested in his neighbor's dog, Sam, hence the name, and was sentenced to six consecutive life sentences in state prison. Berkowitz claimed that the dog demanded the blood of pretty young girls and that the possessed Labrador issued irresistible commands. Even scarier, in 1977, after his arrest, he was permitted to write one letter to the public, in which he stated that there were other sons, seemingly meaning he was not alone in these crimes, but no one else was ever charged. Then later in the 90s, after becoming an evangelical Christian, he admitted that the whole dog and the devil story was a hoax and that he was actually a part of a satanic cult that orchestrated the incidents as ritual murders. But no matter what, he still killed and terrorized people, so just thank your lucky stars, he'll be in prison for the rest of his life. Coming in at number 7, John Justin Bunting. Known as the ringleader for the infamous Snowtown murders, Bunting is responsible for the death of 11 people in South Australia between 1992 and 1999. John Justin Bunting was a troubled man known to have an intense hatred for homosexuals as well as and while we can all agree that it's fair he hated 
The problem is that he never had any proof that his victims were criminals of such things, and would essentially just assume they were, usually because they were also gay, and he kind of felt those two things were one in the same. Most of his victims were either friends, roommates, or relatives, and along with his three other conspirators, they would kidnap the victims, then torture them in various sick ways before taking their lives. The case was uncovered when the remains of eight people were found in barrels of acid in Snowtown, Australia, then three days later, two more victims were found buried, and allegedly their final victim was fried and eaten by Bunting and his gang. After a series of trials, Bunting was ultimately declared the ringleader and was sentenced to 11 consecutive life sentences with no possibility for parole. The others faced similar charges, each serving one life sentence per charge, and these monsters will thankfully be locked up until their last days. Next up at number 6, The Golden State Killer A former police officer, Joseph James D'Angelo, was active between 1974 and to 1986 and is thought to have been responsible for 13 deaths, 51 brutal assaults and 120 burglaries across California. Like many others, D'Angelo also loved taunting the police and would not only send in letters to the authorities, but actually call them and leave messages telling them about his next victim. In 1973, D'Angelo got his job as a police officer, ironically in the burglary unit, and served for six years, but in August of 1979 was put on probation after being caught shoplifting and then later fired that October. Now, D'Angelo was not happy with the station, and during the process of being fired, he actually threatened to kill the chief of police and allegedly stalked the chief's house for nights on end. For a long time, police couldn't figure out who was committing these atrocities, but finally in 2018, thanks to DNA tracing, they were able to pin it all on D'Angelo. In June of 2020, he pleaded guilty to all 13 killings, but only 13 assaults the statute of limitations for his other crimes had expired. Upon his arrest, he said there was an inner personality named Jerry who acted as the controller of all the crimes, and that it was this inner man that forced his hand. He said, I pushed Jerry out and have had a happy life since, but I did all those things and I destroyed all those lives, so now I've got to pay the price. Well, pay the price he did as D'Angelo was sentenced to life in prison with no chance at parole. Next up at number 5. Charles Cullen. Most of the time when we go to a hospital, we believe we are in kind and good hands. Not many of us really know much of anything about what medicines or procedures they prescribe to us, so generally speaking, most will just go with what they give us. And it's exactly this kind of trust that Charles Cullen relied on as a nurse that helped him get away with a confirmed 29, but likely hundreds of killings during his 16 year career. Cullen worked as a nurse between 1987 to 2003 bouncing from hospital to hospital every few years once people started getting suspicious. Apparently, not much pre-planning went into who he would pick as his victims, but nonetheless would administer a lethal overdose by injection to his patients he deemed as ready to die. When he was arrested in 2003, it was only on one count, as they had only confirmed one victim. But Cullen confessed to 40. He maintained that he was saving them from future torture, like going into coding or slow grim deaths, but this didn't line up with reality as many of his victims were not terminal patients. In some cases, even after his confession, Cullen would adamantly deny that he was even involved in the killings. However, after reviewing medical records, he would then double back and admit his involvement. Eventually, he was sentenced to 11 consecutive life sentences, and he will not be up for parole until 2388, which unless he's immortal? will never happen. Coming in at number 4, BTK. Between 1974 to 1991, Dennis Rader, nicknamed BTK, killed 10 people in Wichita, Kansas, and was known to send taunting letters to the authorities and media describing his crimes in gruesome detail. To the public and his community, he was a totally normal, polite, and well-mannered man. Rader was an active member of his church and was actually elected president of the church council and even volunteered 
appeared as a Cub Scout leader. He had a wife and kids who would describe him as totally average and nice guy. But Raider had a dark secret that would soon change everything. Despite his outward persona, Raider was actually a truly disturbed man and was into some pretty terrifying things in the bedroom that eventually leaked their way into his crimes. To start off, I'll give you a hint, BTK is an abbreviation that stands for Blind Torture Kill. And it was disgusting things along those lines that he liked to do to, as he puts it, trapped and helpless women. And if a woman wasn't available, he would take pictures of himself in women's clothing, wearing a mask of a woman's face, and bind himself as he seemed to enjoy living out a fantasy as his own victims. There was a strange hiatus in his crimes for about 10 years, but then in 2004, it seemed that he was back at it again. Thankfully, this creep was arrested in 2005 and is currently serving 10 consecutive life sentences, one for each of the women he killed. Raider lives out his days in solitary confinement and will likely do so for the rest of his life as no parole date seems to be in sight. Next up at number 3, Victor Sayenko and Igor Suprunia. Active for only a year in 2000. 2007, these two friends took the lives of 21 people for what seems to have been sheer pleasure. The two started as friends in childhood and by their youth already started getting into trouble. But then at just 19 were arrested for the death of 21 people. According to one of the suspect's girlfriends and many classmates, Igor was in contact with some unknown rich foreign website operator and had a deal to kill 40 people and film it for the dark web. The website site operator promised them a huge sum of money once all the films were made. So Igor and Victor took to the world, creating their snuff in hopes that they would get rich, but truthfully I have no idea what their plan was after that. Once arrested, it was discovered this was not the first time they'd filmed horrible things for the internet as the pair had previously committed multiple accounts of animal abuse on film. The boys were ultimately convicted of their crimes, Victor found guilty for 18 counts and Igor guilty for 21, and both were sentenced to life in prison. Thankfully, these monsters will stay far away from the public for the rest of their lives. Coming in at number 2, Rosemary West. Along with her husband Fred West, between 1973 to 1987, Rosemary was responsible for the death and torturing of at least 10 young women, one of which was her stepdaughter Charmaine. Together with her husband, she would track down young women and essentially make him a them while telling the girls that this was how the world works, so just lay there and get used to it. Fred had two kids from a previous marriage, and the couple together also had another three, and they were not exempt from the abuse. In fact, they were frequently physically assaulted among even worse acts and told that this was a father's job to do to his daughter. But don't get it twisted, Rose's hands were not clean. She too would the victims, especially her own family. Most notoriously, Charmaine, who did not survive the abuse but all five offspring as well as the family nanny. Upon the initial arrest, it was Fred who was accused of the assaults and killings and Rose was merely accused of involvement. But it dropped because their daughter refused to testify. But soon after, more victims were found and in 1994, when Fred was arrested, he confided that Rose was a part of everything. Rose was arrested but denied any involvement. But this time their family came forward, providing evidence of the years of endless cruelty. After being found guilty on all accounts, Rose lodged an appeal maintaining that Fred was solely responsible and that she too was a victim in all this. However, with so much evidence saying otherwise, the court denied the appeal and sentenced her to life in prison with no parole. And in our number one spot, the pig farmer killer. Robert William Picton, or as he prefers, Willie, is a Canadian pig farmer responsible for killing 49 women between 1982 to 2002. Deemed potentially the most prolific killer Canada has ever seen, Willie was known to be a fairly quiet and simple guy by his friends and family and after his parents' deaths took over the family farm in 1980. But once he was in charge of the farm, he soon became a monster. While it's not known exactly the details of each crime, it's believed he would engage with escorts and then in the middle of 
well, you know, would get extremely angry and blame them for thefts or other crimes. The situations would escalate and he would ultimately handcuff the victims before stabbing them and taking their lives. Now, the creepiest part is that from there, he would take the bodies of the victims and put them through a wood chipper and then feed it to his pigs. And it is believed that some of the resulting flesh bits would get mixed up with pork mints and then sold to his friends and family. Upon his 2002 arrest for his crimes, Willie admitted to all accounts and was even disappointed as he was trying to round out his tally to an even 50 prior to being caught. He admits that because of this goal, he got a little sloppy near the end and believes that this is why police caught him. Willie was sentenced to a life in prison with no chance of parole for at least 25 years, although it seems highly unlikely they are ever going to let him leave. Shockingly, in 2016, Willie published a book from the inside titled Picton, in his own words, where he claims that he was merely a victim of a bungled investigation and that he never actually committed any of the crimes, despite having confessed to all accounts years earlier. Not surprisingly, his book was not received well and Willie remains behind bars, hated, where he will be for the rest of his life. Well there you have it guys, my name is Kennedy. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe and I'll see you next time.